Obviously, anybody who cares is probably already here, so that's all that really matters. <laughs> so, um, classical, I don't really have a talk, so this is kind of a boff. So, part of my idea is uh, actually collecting input from people. Um, basically, I guess the, uh, the background is um, I've been kind of tasked by Lenaro to fix analysis test of Deja, you know, of the tool chain, basically. We can't really tell if we're making ARM support better and we need better tools, which is better testing plugs into a lot of that stuff. So um, some of the ideas I've been bouncing around recently and stuff, um, more or less all kind of push me into this mode of um, refactoring Deja GNU. Um, I think it's probably about time to do that and stuff. A lot of the, well, I can't say the design of Deja Gnu, I should say the implementation, because it really was never designed. It was built while using it, and that's kind of part of its problem. Um, and it was overly flexible, so it's got a lot of arbitrary stuff in it that just people throw in, poor documentation and all that. So um, part of the thought is, um, in sort of working on, I guess you'd say Deja Gnu 2.0, is to actually take the existing implementation, turn it in, turn it into kind of pseudocode, look at what people do, and then think of all the the problems in it and clean it up and do a new implementation. So um, one of the biggest problems some of us are having, like me and Ian were just talking, is uh, I'm not sure how long Tickle's going to be around. It's kind of dropped into this unmaintained state. And I was co-maintainer of Tickle for 10 years. I don't want to go back there. <laughs> So um, there's been a lot of discussion about that. Um, the discussion from most people, um, and actually my co-maintainer Ben Elliston, is to rewrite Deja Gnu in Python, which um, some people would probably like. Yeah, you can stop me anytime. I was just going to comment as you're going down that direction <laughs> that some, I don't know, it was like eight or ten years ago with the software carpentry concept or contest, Code Sorcery actually did a sort of second generation QM code. test. Yeah, QM test. Yeah. I think if we're, particularly if we're looking at the idea of rewriting something in Python, particularly since QFDS is written in Python, oh, okay. it might be well worth considering whether there are pieces of that that we can... So is that publicly available? Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah, and actually I was working on an internal project at Sorcery for many years that actually used that as our main test harness. And so... Does it do GDB or just GCC? Because GDB is the, the real problem with... T yeah, testing. It, yeah, it is. I don't. I don't know actually whether we've done whether we even did GCC much with it. This was a completely separate math library, but it was. But it was using QM tests as its test harness. So, huh? Because unless it did GDB, I mean, so yeah, most of the design of Deja is based on GDB. I mean, because yeah, so that's the hard thing to test. That, that, that would then would be well worth. Yeah. So what are some of the specific things in GDB that are? So uh, basic. So you know. The original version of Deja Gnu, funny enough, was written for GDB testing. Yeah. And it was a series of born shell scripts. They'd like try to run a command and it would diff it against some text file. But we quickly realized that wasn't really sufficient, right. especially you have, you know, sequences of commands you need to execute to do things like that. Okay. And so, so kind of... It was kind of heavily based on sort of the expect problem. So the whole idea of using expect was Deja Gnu could kind of pretend it was the end user and typing commands and getting output back. Um, but, you know, latency with cross-testing and all sorts of stuff and buffering issues and expect and all these things has made that complicated. And it's mostly been beaten into shape. But um, I don't really know another way to test GDB. Yeah, I think we <laughs> end up with, with doing that in QM test, I think what you would end up with, it is a relatively modular design. There aren't any modules in it that do that kind of thing. But I think that there would be a good place to plug such a thing in and get a reasonable Okay. Yeah, and, and, and part of the other thoughts I've had too is, um, you know, the output format of Deja Gnu was in the beginning designed not to be the thing everybody used. It was designed to be sort of a standardized text file that other processing tools used. As I've been discovering lately, um, processing, you know, a text file with 97,000 test results in it isn't really practical and especially with the way GCC testing is you've got your multi-libs you have different command line options you've got you know every little configure option that the DG style test cases use I'd almost want to track all that stuff separately so one of the things I've been doing a lot recently is um, and some people may or may not like this idea is I've been putting a lot of stuff into a database and yeah. doing pretty pictures for those guys who pay, make you know, pay my paycheck basically. Yeah. Um, but at the same point as I think that some of that if done correctly can actually be useful to developers. Right. You know, I would like to make a change and make sure I haven't broken other architectures or other variants of the same chip. I would love to be able to compare, you know, 
test cases um, on, at various optimizer levels and stuff like that. And I think the existing output format isn't really well suited to that unless you want to get in these really ugly aux scripts parsing, you know, the, the somewhat arbitrary text field. Um, exactly. It's, you know, like, oh, there's a dash 03, you know, and stuff like that. So one of my thoughts is, as it, we re-architecting it, is to have a lot more fine-grained knowledge of exactly what was done. Um, yeah. Oh, actually, I'll back up from that. So in the beginning, Deja GNU was also considered to be a generic test framework that people could create testing tools in for all sorts of people. I even have marketing literature at home trying to sell Deja GNU to customers. Thank God nobody ever bought it. Um, my current belief now is that nobody truly uses it for anything other than my Ganache project. So I think part of my goal is to make Deja Gnu for toolchain testing. It just seems like it should be more tightly coupled and have the kinds of stuff in there that toolchain people really want to use that nobody else could care about. Because I don't think anybody else cares anyway, except us. So it might as well meet our needs. Um, You mean for testing? You mean f for the tool chain, everybody's stuck using Deja Like all the M's seems to have a home main kind of setup. Right. And I. I've been looking at LLVM stuff. Um, they do some things that I kind of like. Um, they also have a data-driven approach, and I managed to get a copy of the database schema. And actually, after I get home and sleep for two days, I'm going to be starting to look at merging their database schema in. They also do some weird stuff, like they time every test case execution. And so they run them 10 and 20 times, they actually have a few milliseconds of timing. I'm not really sure if I want to do that. Um, yeah, that seems like the ability to do that would be really useful. You know, if you're not the ability where we're trying to measure energy, the ability to actually have a, and in fact I'm trying to put this into data at the moment, is, to be able oh, to be, is the ability to be able to say for each program I've tested, there are some parameters about its behavior during the test beyond just pass and fail, right? Well, whether it's its energy usage or its size or its execution time. That's actually yeah. hugely valuable. Well, what if the claims are faster in GCC, you wouldn't want to blow that just because you're hacking away and weren't paying attention. Yeah, I mean, I know the L well, timing in test case is different than like running a benchmark. I know that the LLVM guys at Lenaro and stuff, they're not really big on the, the timing of every individual test case. I mean, for a benchmark, it's a whole different ballgame and stuff. I have debated um, tracking the comp compilation time of a test yeah, case. Yeah, they do pay attention to compilation time. Right. So that, that I actually I think makes sense a lot because sometimes you make changes and suddenly it compiles slower or takes longer to compile or faster. I think the other problem with testing every test case is, especially when you're doing cross-testing, you know, you have latency and other issues. I'm running test cases. My build farm is in Cambridge 4,000 miles away. <laughs> you know, things like that. I'm not sure how that, but it might not be that hard to add it as an optional thing. And these are kind of the things I'm, I've thought I'm about. Sure the module structure that gives the hook there for the likes of me who want to go and hook in a hardware energy tester to be able to do that in a fairly straightforward way. Okay. Yeah. Can, I, can I flag up? I was just going to say, I think, I think there are actually two relevant general hooks. One of them is you need a hook that, kind of the general hook of being able to specify on kind of a I as a site programmer, want to specify how you run a test program on my system, which may include collecting additional data. And then there's also a hook of, in the data, database data format, the ability to store extra data beyond just pass fail about the test results. And that's, I think, one of the changes that has to happen is an ability to store a lot more data. And, um, yeah, and I think what Jeremy is kind of pointing at is if a lot more data maybe is a lot, is sort of needs to have expansibility so that people can add arbitrary things to it. Yeah, because I guess different people's needs are sort of specific. Right. And, and you'll have people off in group orders doing something that <laughs> yeah, and the same point is if I change the output format even slightly, I'll probably piss off tons and tons of people I've never ever talked to that have some obscure text file parsing scripts. But right, yeah. that's <laughs> life. Text file is the wrong answer. Yeah, so, um, yeah. I mean, uh, I was going to say, toss in a couple of other items to, to say. One is, I mean, I tend to work on the embedded stuff, so very across systems. Making yeah. it easier to use different protocols. You've got to always remote testing, you need one thing to get your, your data, your files across, and one to execute your program to get the result back. Yeah. And just making it easier to add new protocols in, so that, you know, at the moment, it's not well documented in the party, but it's also 
trying to remember, you need a protocol open, a protocol close, a protocol, right. back, then a protocol spawn, a protocol upload, a protocol download. I can't remember what the full set is. If you could have that actually a bit cleaner, so that when I come along with a new system that has yet another way, that's the only way it can get programs over. It's not right. a nightmare trying to write that. That's the first issue I look okay. at. The second is, we're in environments where I can test against very large numbers of machines if only I had the power of it. You know, one of our standard architectures has 64 cores, and I could actually run GCC regression 64-fold. Right. If standard GCC regression parallelism would go down that fine. So that's a good point, because one of the other things I would like to do is to add, I guess, more actual inherent ability to run tests in parallel. Um, I have the same problem. I'm testing on some incredibly painfully slow hardware, the ARM64 simulator. It takes me a week and a half to run the test suite. So I get two runs a month. It's kind of useless. Um, well, I mean, it's not useless, but it's kind of painful. And so yeah. if I could run multiples of those, it, I would actually benefit greatly, because I could actually get results back before, you know, I have problems with it and things like that. Um, I know there's some parallelism, but it's kind of crude and not really and done. GCC make file as opposed to built into Deja Academy. Right. Um, part of my thought too is that the GCC testing pieces that have developed over the years and stuff is about the most sophisticated use of Deja GNU at all. So part of my thoughts is to look at a lot of that stuff, like the DG style testing, which we didn't start with, that was added later, and moving a lot of that support into the core um, so that other people could potentially use it and things like that, which maybe would benefit for the, uh, the remote testing protocol stuff. Um, if we refactor it into another language, well, I mean, Python's object-oriented, I believe. I don't know Python, so this will be interesting. Yeah. But um, my thought is that having an object-oriented approach may clean things up a lot more than the current version. I mean, Tickle is pretty bad. Lack of da good data structures is a pain. Um, cleaning up board support files, which is kind of also arbitrary, would be kind of nice. Um, but uh, definitely, I want a lot more output. Um, in my own case, as I said, I would like to be able to chart stuff. I mean, I've got some charts where I compare, like, I'll take a snapshot of GCC and I'll run it across 10 different processors and things and it's kind of interesting to see how different CPU types you know compare as far as their percentages of test results and things like that but it might be more interesting to see you know if certain configuration options for GCC break things um, another thing I have is it would be nice to see if I'm using different versions of lower level libraries um, I mean we have a bug that we just found literally last week that may actually be in graphite <laughs> but we have no way of really knowing because we don't have a sort of a baseline to test it against. Um, but it stopped compiling G GTK, <laughs> which is a problem. <laughs> um, so, um, but yeah, th so that's kind of the thought is to sort of, as I said, I'm, I'm definitely into a kind of a more data-centric thing because a lot of it, we all diffed some files so we can check regressions on our last release, but I may actually want to have a single test case and plot its sort of success and failure sign curve over a whole bunch of releases. Um, I'm also doing a lot of stuff these days with comparing code sorcery branches, FSF branches, Linaro branches, and other people's weird branches and stuff like that to see, kind of track how we're all kind of doing. And they're actually all different, which is kind of amusing. I mean, you think they'd all have the exact same results, but different patches at different times and all that kind of stuff. Um, and part of this, at least on the Linaro side, is to justify that we're actually improving things, because we don't really know. <laughs> Um, you know, ultimately, you know, and since some of my charts, I could even show one of the charts if people wanted to. Um, I, don't, I could look up their projector, but it's probably just as easy. You know, and yeah, I mean, x86 is probably, you know, the best pass rate because that's what everybody works on. Arms like way down here somewhere as far as a percentage of passes out of the total test cases and stuff. It'll be nice to watch those lines kind of get more converging. And especially with, you know, 64-bit arm stuff, um, it's even lower than that. And it would be nice to have some kind of metrics that actually tell we're doing the right things. Um, and even if the optimizing guys, I mean, you know, they fix the optimizer, it may break regressions all the time. So there's other ways of testing it that don't even have anything to do with benchmarks. Um, we run benchmarks, but we can't tell anybody about it. <laughs> um, but that's kind of part of the idea. So, and yeah, some of the other thoughts too I had is um, if I start doing more database stuff, I mean, it'll probably always produce text file output. Um, if I start putting all these other things like test case timing fields, I'm not quite sure. I mean, maybe the, the string that it outputs just gets bigger. Because right now you have the test state and you've got the quote name, which has been overloaded to have all of the relevant data. And it may be that I have to break it into a lot more um, fields and things like that. I've yeah. I've and one of the things that would be very useful there if it's staying in text file is 
making sure that things are delimited and quoted so that you can tell what is the end of the name. Yeah, so, what, so, so have you ever used the XML option to run test? I have not. Is that, <laughs> is that one that has to solve my problem? Yes. OK. Nobody has ever heard of this. It was one of the, I've never heard of this. Yes. Exactly. Run test dash dash XML. And it produces an XML file that sucks right in. It imports into MySQL without any changes at all. Okay. That may well be. <laughs> Makes your life a lot easier. And yeah, since it's all XML gunk. Um, and that's what I've been doing a lot of. And right now, so if you go to, to the Deja GNU source repository on Savannah, there's a branch called MySQL. And there's a script in there also that converts some files to XML files. So that, I did that so I could, could basically, I imported three years of Lunar testing results into a database. It was like 300 million records. It, was, it took like six weeks to import. But it was quite fascinating when I did that. Yeah. But the, I've also debated having sort of a CSV output. You know, it would yeah. be text. but And you can parse the text files, but parsing the text files takes like 15 minutes per file. Yeah. You know, so um, and I've even debated actually adding support to write directly to the database, blowing off the text at all. We're kind of working on a, um, one of the current things I'm working on as well is a full automated continuous build infrastructure um, and stuff like that. And at that point, I don't even really care about the text file. <laughs> exactly. I mean, that was one of the things that that in QM test was a nice architectural thing there. Since it was written in Python, it basically, basically the data it collected as this vector of Python objects. Um, and Python has a standard way of dumping those into a binary data file. Okay. So that was what it used as its main output format. And then when you wanted something either in human re readable printout or kind of a synopsis form of the human readable printout or whatever, then that was a separate thing that then went and post-processed your test database. Right. But in the actual database, you had all of the stuff, like command line, like standard out from all of the test functions and all of this data in an extensible way that you would never actually want to humanly look at, but you might want to have something that parsed it. Yeah, and my assumption is there's a definite use of having straight ASCII text files that are human readable and stuff. Right. But I'm realizing that multiple output formats would make it easier for people to yeah. do things with. Like just, I mean, yeah, you can convert the sum file to CSV and suck it into a database. Yeah. But um, it takes like 15 minutes to parse the sum file, and it takes like another 15 minutes to import it into MySQL. If I put it in the database directly, it would be done. Because if I can only do th import three an hour, well, my developers do more builds than that, you know, so. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> and, so, yeah, mm -hmm. so, so, so my, yeah, so my point there is just, I think having the, the canonical output be the text file is making it, making it everything else harder. And yeah, right. we probably want all these other outputs, but having an intermediate thing, having a immediate output that makes it easy to generate whatever you want, including generate the human readable text. Right is much easier than doing the text and then trying to process Yeah, the, the other thing I found too is that um, in some of the stuff I've been doing lately is I'm capturing a lot more information about the build environment, right? Because just having pass and fail and unsupported is kind of cool, but it doesn't, like, why is it unsupported on this platform? So I've been doing a lot of stuff where I trap the processor, how many cores it has, you know, how many yeah. threads it has, the versions of the different libraries that GCC uses. Um, you know, maybe somebody's got some weird bug because they're using an ancient version of GMP and somebody doesn't have the bug because they're using a newer version. So, right, I'm so you've got a lot, of, a lot of kind of metadata about the test run. Ex exactly. And I'm trying to track all the various dependencies and stuff so that we see problems, we can kind of go back and say, oh, you know, on this host we have that problem. Right. Um, and that's been kind of interesting, kind of defining these schemes. And LLVM, I think, does a lot of that, too. They've got a whole, I mean, they've got, what, something like 10 different little tables in their database and stuff. Um, and I said, I've got the schemas. I'm going to look at them a lot more um, after the conference. I've been doing other stuff. But, um, but that was kind of the ideas. And I guess I'm also kind of curious. Um, so the suggestions have been made to rewrite it in Python. So I don't know Python, I'll be honest. I'd have to learn it. Which, but then again, I learned Tickle to do it the first time. So what the hell? <laughs> Right, but it seems like you know most people seem to think that's a good idea. Um, I'm wondering if, why do we need a third language at all? Um, you could write your tests, uh, like, like you do unit tests, uh, and write in C. I don't know how it works for GCC, but for GDB, well, if you want GDB, well, open GDB, 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 connection. The yeah. GDB needs effectively scripting. Right. right. Yeah, sure. We do this, and we do that. We can do a command. We can do run some compiled commands. You know, it's kind of a whole mishmash of stuff, so it doesn't yeah. really fit naturally the way you get your 
programming language. You want to language that has so some sort of speaking language of some sort. Um, yeah. uh, but once the actual test starts, the difficulty is also the expect magic. When you don't parse the prompt, your test is all of sync and all this stuff. So if you write if you write your test in C, you open in a my connection to GDB, and, and in MI, you don't have the problem of the parser because you leave your the result is structured. So you no, know, but the point no is one has to test that the output matches what you, the user expects. Right. Yeah, but you can do this in, in, in your, if you write a C program in the test, so you are much more flexible uh, than in Tickle. Um, so, it's strictly string processing. You want yeah. good string manipulation. If there's a language you're going to write it, it'd be Snowball 4. I don't think that's going to win many votes. Um, <laughs> so, a modern scripting language of which Python is, is semantically much cleaner than TCL, so you're more likely to get it right. Yes, yeah, so I. You use the plus, but you have your, the, the regex for, uh, part of the library, you have all the string parts you need. Uh, so, you have the structured output in MI, you don't need to make sure parse all the lines you have in photo mode, you can just ignore them. But I don't want to just test MI, I want to test all of GDP. Yeah, we right. Right. test everything. Yeah, test I want to test the planes I can already use. Right, but if you, if you make the model CLI go over MI, uh, then MI, MI accesses all the features, so you have everything no, except for the CLI. Not true. Not true. It's not true. It's not true. MI does not even access all the features. Not yet. It's, it's been yeah. an on, well, it's been 10 years of ongoing store point. Right. You know, I want to add a command. Yeah, and there's, there's places where there's, there's a reason for the differences. Um, and that's why we have MI tests that are distinct from the MI tests. And the same test might be used for a lot of different targets. And it might be used for an embedded thing. The functions on it might be different. I mean, there are a lot of variables along the way. Right. But I don't think that people who are in GDB, when people fix bugs, do they have to add a test? You'd hope so. <laughs> <laughs> right. We're better about that than we used to be. I mean, writing tests is hard enough, but if you have to actually write something. Well, the, yeah, in the classic problem with GDB testing, is some of the regexes are pretty brutally complicated. <laughs> I find writing a test in C easier than writing a test in Tickle, for example. And, also, and when I find a bug in my test, it's much easier to debug because it's just a normal C program, I can debug through all the steps. I don't have to figure out what uh, Tickle did in order to set up uh, GDB to arrive at the point where the bug occurs. I just had to break it and run. So this is much more convenient. And, and I, I know the C language, so it's easier for me to, right. to, to do things I want to do in C than trying to figure out what this in Tickle. And uh, I do notice that a lot of LPM testing seems to be built around writing C programs to test stuff. Right. Well, and then funny enough, there's actually support in Deja GNU for unit testing, which lets you write test cases in C. I'm not so sure about GDB, but in the Ganache project, I actually use this extremely heavily for unit level testing. And the end result is it does all the C-based regexes and compiles the test case and runs it on my embedded target, and I still have to pass, parse the, the output for pass, fail, and whatever else. Um, so I've done that exactly what you suggest. If you look at the Ganache test suite, which is m one of my other projects, um, it does exactly what you're talking about. I think I like the scripting language slightly better. Um, I use the compiled C style test cases when I'm testing C based libraries. But like I said, GDP is a whole nother ball game. I mean, I worry a little bit about expect going away someday, but I think it's more maintained and has a longer term. Just nobody, I mean, expect just keeps working. So and my assumption is it'll run for a long time, but I think expect's going to be around a lot longer than Tickle. Um, I mean, then the whole, yeah? Oh, okay. Um, so where's. Right. Uh, well, and if I'm going to refactor it, my thought was, you know, adding functionality to it and fixing output formats and stuff like that. I'm not really sure if I want to keep doing it in Tickle, to be honest. Yeah, because of some of the uh, good stuff, your library stuff, and you know, what the first thing you should probably do is just start ditching all the junk. You know, ROM 68K, we're not using that anymore. Oh my god, I really. I actually still have that hardware at home. <laughs> Hasn't been turned on in 15 years. <laughs>
Yeah. If you prune it down to just a maintained tool chain, ditch all the files for unmaintained configs, okay, that's going to give you a better idea of what features still need to be supported. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of historical gunk in there, like you said, for hardware that no longer, I mean, does anybody even build 68Ks anymore? <laughs> I did a year ago. I thought, it, I thought the 68K stub actually got depreciated out of GDB. Makes me feel old. <laughs> is that cold fire? Yeah, cold fire. Cold fire sort of the cold is cold fire. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I think, well, and actually, I guess the 68K stub was the first GDP stub and ever. Some of the stuff is not so much about how to configure, it's actually more configuring boards that are long gone. Right. And, uh, you know, some of the lost engineering remote 68K, you know, the testing doesn't have to care about that. Just use the engineering stuff to So, as a dumb question, do you know how the Python? scripting where that is in the GDB? I mean, can I literally call GDB commands from the Python scripting level? I'm just curious. For some things, it seems like it would be a nice extension to the existing tests to be able to, you know, test GDB at that level as opposed to just the sort of user interface, you know, string parsing level. Um, and some of the GDB test files are huge. I wouldn't mind figuring out ways to break them into slightly more manageable chunks. I mean, some of those have got to be thousands of lines long at this point. <laughs> just hard to manage. There's certainly opportunities there. Right, right. Um, yeah, and then GCC testing, as I said, it's kind of a whole different ballgame. Those tests are much more batch oriented. And using expect for that, I mean, I would like to get rid of ne even needing expect. Well, it's barely used in GCC testing anyway, except when it's doing remote testing. But I think I could even get rid of that. Um, I think Python's got a lot of support for some of that that's not, you know, there. And it may be that we need kind of a generic, like he was saying, remote testing framework that makes it a little bit easier to add protocols and stuff. Um, I don't know. I mean, the last time I added a protocol, I added it was at support for using ADB, you know, for Android testing. But that was easy because you just run ADB on the command line and it's all done. So it wasn't really interactive. Um, interactive remote testing is kind of a pain in the neck. Um. And, and, uh, oh, I was just going to say, definitely having that standardized enough so that when I write that for something, I can do it across what I've written works across all of the various things I want to test. Right. Is a very useful thing insofar as it's possible. Insofar well, as it's not possible. And it's kind of how it works now. I mean, that was yeah. the whole idea is that you have a test case and you can run it yeah. against any target as long exactly. as you had that the target support know how yeah. to access so within, it. Within the tool chain, it's all fixed. Yeah. And even in the GDP side, it would be nice to be able to run tests in parallel as well. Yeah. Um, and one, one of the things that come from that team is to make it easier to people contribute stuff back. So one of the things I'm always doing is using Telnet as one of the protocols. Yep. And Telnet is partly there, but it's not fully there. It hasn't got the proper open and store. Right. It's like a standard busy box. It's actually the easiest way to get stuff in. Right. And lots of people have written these missing Telnet bits, but they've never gone into the main. Yeah. And I think if you, the cleaner you make it, the easier it is for people to say, oh, well, and now I'll contribute it back. Yeah, because I don't think I've seen any Telnet patches come across the no, mailing I list ever. As well, because I haven't actually contributed mine in yet. <laughs> yeah, it's... I mean, one thing that was not, it, not immediately clear to me when I was doing a similar thing for SSH testing last month was, is there an active Deja Kudu community? Where is it? Where would I send this stuff anyway? So... Uh, there's a semi-active Deja GNU community. I mean, me and Ben, my co-maintainer and stuff, but both of us have been basically doing other things right. for a while. Huh? Yeah, but you're talking about Mendel's. Yeah. Yeah, and, he, and Ben's, you know, so I'll be honest, I got distracted. I started this silly project called Ganache, yeah. and it sucked up the last seven years of my life. <laughs> but Ganache is not conveniently dead, so funny enough is, um, 
one of my tasks is working on Deja Ganu again as my income. So I've got a lot more motivation now to be paying a lot more attention to it, which is the only way I would have time to refactor because this is not going to be a trivial project. I mean, it may take me a long time to get it all yeah. done. Um, GCC, bin utils tests will probably be a lot easier and stuff. GDB, uh, boy, that's going to be yeah. interesting. So, I'm like, I'll, I'll hold my opinion in GLibC. Um, well, that could be possible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, and mind you, one of the nice things about Deja Gano is you can actually write wrappers for existing test suites and, yeah. and import it into Deja Gano. So I actually, somebody said this to me yesterday, so I was running the GLibC test cases this morning. It aborts on my laptop, so that didn't get me anywhere. But it has, like, no output. Exactly. Yeah, no, that's, that's <laughs> the problem with GLibC that it needs to have its test suite. Same and having a framework to connect it to Right. But it's it is doing work, right? Well and and especially on you know at Lenaro and stuff, I mean, you know, all of our member companies are using GLibC pretty much. Some use new lib as well and stuff. So for us we would like to be able to have better yeah. you know, GLibC testing and stuff. I'm not sure if I'm gonna do that because I may be busy on the core. My hope would be some other <laughs> motivated person um, would actually do that. I don't know how hard it would be to wrap sort of an existing Deja Gnu framework around the yeah, uh, I mean, GLibC test. I may be at. If I manage to carve out some time, I would. I mean, as far as I can tell, they mostly compile test cases in a s slightly similar way to the GCC. Right. And um, they just don't have any output. <laughs> I mean. And, and someone would do weird things like poking into the build tree to look at stuff. That's ear evil. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I read this email last week about asking because so how does how are you being to make cross testing work on the test tweet? Joseph right. Myers wrote me this long right. <laughs> Joseph Myers helpful essay about all of the things wrong with the genomes of testing it was frightening. So, so here's a dumb question. Is, that, is anybody here actually on the Deja Gnu mailing list? Bunch of masochists. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's very low bandwidth. <laughs> yeah, but I mean presumably if, if someone submits a patch you will ban us and he's, he's really exactly. Yeah, yeah. We've been pretty good about that. We, we get little minor bug fixes all the time, and we, we try and get those in, but um, at the same point as, you know, we're not really doing anything to the core. We just add bug fixes. Um, the actual idea for rewriting Deja Gnu in Python actually came from Ben, because he wants to do it too. And so um, I haven't talked to him for a couple of weeks, but I believe he's going to have some more free time this fall, and that's about the time I'm going to be able to start really digging into it. So my hope is that me and Ben can work on a lot of this sort of Python idea re-implementation together. But my main goal is to actually just, so I'm a big fan of not surprising people. I think that's what works well in the, I'll say free software community, which I think some people call open source. Um, discussing it on the list as we start having changes and things and really thinking things through and getting more of a, I don't want to screw up anybody's job because we all need to run the test suites to, you know, to get through our day to day job. Luckily we can run the existing version for as long as it'll keep running, which is probably a long time um, and stuff like that. But my hope is me and Ben can work on it more actively. Um, pretty soon now um, we'll start hopefully discussing some of these ideas on the list, but I, it's usually me and Ben just talking to each other. So nobody else seems to care, um, <laughs> which is, you know, I guess good and bad. It means we can do anything we want, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, and escaping 10 zillion little characters. And, and I don't actually know if Python makes that easier or harder. So I've been told. What other options would be that would be attractive? So I've been told that Python does not have good regular expression support. But that's only what I've heard. I have no idea for sure. And maybe there's a, some Python module that adds, you know, full POSIX style regular expressions. Um, the other thing with Tickle is, and expect as well, is that it does both sort of POSIX style regular expressions and kind of born shell, you know, glob style expressions, and it uses both. <laughs> I mean, I would love to get rid of escaping things because I have horrible memories of some things are escape the escape of the escape of the escape to get a bracket and things like that. Yeah. It gets pretty nasty. Yeah, exactly. 
It, it reminds me of programming a Lisp and adding parentheses, you know. <laughs> um, Right. It's probably the whole standard. That was my impression, but it's not yeah. science. Perl is sort of the, at least my impression, is Perl is the standard of what people use and expect everything else to work on. Whether that is well, a general validation. Or you, 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 you can ask the question of whether re regular expressions will stop. I mean, regular expressions, of course, are formally yeah. you know, perfectly powerful. But you can also down, go down some of the more string process and so uh, go back and, you know, if you look at the sort of things you get in the markup languages like um, Snowball, yeah. they, they, then you're looking beyond, functionally it's no different to a vector expression, but in terms of its expressiveness and the ability to write it down in a way that's easy to understand even if it's complicated, yeah. is actually much richer. But I don't actually know of any modern language that yeah. implements would, that sort of yeah. thing. It, it seems like something that I would not be surprised if somebody has written a Python module that does that. And yeah. there are certainly there are certainly plenty of string parsing regular expression types. Right. So that should be part of the researchers who has the good pattern matching. Just don't say necessarily regular expressions because you know the pattern matching things are available. They, there are some going mm -hmm. on that. So you know, as I said, can't you kind of write wrappers for a lot of Unix libraries and kind of use them from within Python. Yeah. So my assumption is if I had to, I could basically, you know, use the standard, you know, Unix glibc version, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah. you could. Well, I, I, I would imagine you want to a little bit more careful right. approach because the, it's not just the availability of the package, but how you have to bolt it in, right? It's not that particular expressions are bad, it's that, that you need lots of escaping because other rules of language. Right. Right. Yeah, and then of course if I refactor things in kind of an object-oriented design, it may change a lot, although it can't change too much because then we can't modify the existing test suites. The other problem is I looked um, into pexpect, which is a Python expect implementation, but it, they claim it's not very portable. <laughs> And I don't think it's had a patch in like three years. Yeah, and so, with the so part of my thought is I would have to yeah. write a Python, ex, you know, import the regular standard expect into Python. I mean, having worked on expect for a long time, it has a huge amount of workarounds that were very painfully figured out years ago that I would hate to lose. I mm -hmm. wouldn't want to do something that loses portability. Um, yeah. Something that runs on my Linux system and maybe one BSD is not going to achieve yeah, my goal. Never heard of one either. I, yeah, I mean, expect is there and it works well enough. I'm not sure how much motivation it was, other than these guys running P expect in Python. Yeah. Some of research is just, you know, are there some to expect that just happen to be out there and call the funny name, and that's why we have heard Could be. Um, and I get, I mean, and I don't know how else to test like GDB without expect, to be honest. Um, I mean, you run an output and diff it on a text file, that's almost worse. <laughs> Um, yeah, but I don't expect you have to go on program that does tricks with PTY, so, yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> It's a hard enough problem space. I wouldn't think too many people would do it unless they really, really had to. Um, and in case of MI, you could so complete, in case of MI, you could completely remove any regular expression because if you have a full-blown MI parser, you can just compare two uh, structures so, so I'm going to ask a dumb question. What's MI? And it's a machine interface to GDB. And okay. Oh, that's how it describes GDB. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. For instance, uh, to pattern match an address or what, whatever, you can just simply uh, implement a full-blown MI parser. It should be much easier and bulletproof. But it doesn't test what the quote user right. sees. So, so the MI is basically the command line Oh, that might be. Yeah. Now the funny thing is, we've always been a little bit taking kind of a lazy approach to it. It would have been better to invent infrastructure or infrastructure for it to begin with. Because, for instance, regular expressions aren't great because they assume a particular order, and it might just really require that. So you have something that's like a pattern matcher, but not an order-specific pattern matcher. Right. 
a lot, of, a lot of things you need these regular expressions for. Uh, you can maybe just ignore the MMI. If you, if you know there's an address, you don't need a regular expression that matches any addresses. You just look if there's an address tag, and then you ignore the value. Okay. Yeah. So uh, you need a lot less uh, regular expressions than you would need before. Yeah. So, but the same. It's really it's just been a lack of imagination on our parts, right? We can write as many proxies as we want. Right. <laughs> and the problem is we have this huge collection of existing procs, and converting them all to MI is probably beyond my lifetime. <laughs> um, although my hope is I wouldn't be doing this as a solo project. Um, and the other thing, too, is I think within GDB, because it has a user interface, I think you almost need to test that, because that's what people see. Um, Right. See, and I can see adding support for that kind of testing for future test cases that doesn't cover the existing ones. And I think that's the other problem, even considering refactoring, is I had, the, I mean, between GCC, Binutils, and GDB, there's an immense amount of stuff. And I need to figure out a way to refactor this that it actually gets done in a few years. <laughs> um, and if it never gets done, it's kind of useless. Um, GCC being a lot easier, I, I mean, I figured that's probably a couple of months of work. That's probably wrong. A couple of months of work, if I could focus on it, I should say. Um, I'll probably get distracted. Are you testing what the users see? When you put, when you make CLI, this is actually Sandra's suggestion. When you make CLI a thin layer above uh, MI, then you can split the two testing uh, requirements to test the functionality using MI, where it is easy to get the structure. And for CLI, you just need to make sure that uh, what the user types ends up in correct MI strings. And on the other hand, when you get push an arbitrary MI result, that this is printed the way uh, the user would expect. So testing the CLI okay. layer is, is in infinitely simpler than testing the entire GDB. And for testing the GDB, uh, you have this more structured uh, interface for testing the functionality. Yeah, because GDP's output is very far from structured yeah, at all. Yeah, so this the two things uh, could make each of them much simpler, and you may need different tools to tackle each of them. So for a CLI, it's just string manipulation. One string in, another string out, make right. sure the strings match somehow, that's okay. And the functionality goes with the mind. Hmm. Yes, uh, I already, already wrote for GDP the interface of CLI on, on top of MI, but it is far from a complete, but some basic functionality works, but I don't have time to complete it. But it would be great if, if anyone would write CLI on top of MI, then 99% of the test set could be written on top of MI without any expects, and it would work per per perfectly. As, uh, if you run the, the regex expressions and expect you, for example, face a problem of so called read one, as uh, sometimes the a run test reads a block of 20 characters and sometimes it reads just one second or character. Yep, yep. So <laughs> cases behave differently if you write the, the regexes incorrectly, as they depend on which, how many chunks are we yep. in. So I think the user and it would be better if uh, the shadow itself could somehow test it. I, I have a producer which forces read by a single by but in the original description of expect, they basically characterize that as an unsolved problem. Right, because it's... I don't know if that's really true. I mean, it's been a long time since somebody wrote that. The other changes in the infrastructure where you could specify a number of characters that TTY produces. So, but isn't M... Kind of taking that statement as, as granted. I don't know if it's question much. Yeah, and, and sometimes it varied on system load. So depending on what you, else you had running at the same time could it, uh, affect what was in the buffer and stuff like that, which kind of made results. But isn't MI still kind of interactive, is my guess then? <coughs> it still works like a command line interface. So I'd still basically need some yeah, kind of expect like thing to talk to it. Numbers, you can do, it a, you can do a, a somewhat meaningful asynchronous testing. So when you, when you give an MI request, you add a sequence number to it. And so when GDP responds 
sometime later. You can associate the sequence numbers and you can maybe disentangle the uh, several test strings. Right. So I guess this should make it simpler as well, plus the, the structured output. But as I said, I think that would be a good way to maybe create additional test cases, but... You, you, can, uh, 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 you can convert all 90% of the existing test suite to MI where the test will collapse and become much simpler and much more obvious what the test is doing. Yeah, because that would be... the current tickle uh, implementation, you could do this. Yeah, because that would be the, the biggest fear would be doing something where I have to hand code everything. I, um, well, yeah. But if I had 10% left, that's, that's kind of a manageable number. Um, I mean, I remember... You still need to touch each, each test, so it is uh, a, a huge amount of work. Yeah, yeah, so... The other thing about MI is it's, it is something that, sure, you know, if you're a GDP person, MI is no problem. But for everyone else coming to you, you the new Deja Blue, Right. You're going to have to learn MI. <coughs> right, no, you have to learn well, Tickle. Yeah, yeah, but lots of people know Tickle. Well, or, 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 or learning Python, yeah. I mean. Um, so I think there's, you don't want to put unnecessary barriers in the way unless there's a very good reason. Um, yeah, and part of the idea of doing it in Python was merely it is a very popular language that a lot of people know, and it seems like it is going to still be here 10 or 20 years from now. I mean, maybe Tickle will be too, but... Um, it all depends on the MI thing, because I mean, the, the, the strong argument in favor of making the test MI oriented is that that is the way Eclipse gets to it, and that's over time getting to be more the way people get to GDB at all. So that, that's a like point in favor. Um, but it is, it's, it is a subset of GDB functionality, and it's not a well defined mm -hmm. subset, so there's a whole subtask with GDB hacking which just you know, adding stuff that's been missing from MI forever because we don't be bothered, uh, and just kind of generally doing a lot of GDB work just for the sake of testing, which um, uh, that's a lot to sign up to. It's not that we can't do it, but it's a lot to sign up to. I'd rather say that we should have added well, we should have kept MI and CLI in sync, just like GDB server and GDB native. They have different feature sets, and uh, I, I, this is not a desirable situation. So you, you can't have your GUI access all the features just because there's no MI interface. And I, I don't know, but I guess there's also some MI uh, interface for which there's no CLI. So <laughs> this is something. Yes, yes, we're incompetent. Um, <laughs> so if, if, you, if you force the GDB developers to define the MI interface and made it suitably easy to do the CLI on top. Um, well, it's, it's a little bit flamey, and I think to, to some extent we've, we've avoided flame wars just by not requiring that. Probably. <laughs> you have the, the MI the sort of favoring crowd, and then you have the MI hating crowd, and, and sometimes the same person will be both at different times of the day. So, so you have this thing where you know it says yes, I know the MI should be better. We should use it. The Eclipse users use it, but you know I've only ever used command line GED personally. So when it comes down to it, I don't really care about MI that much. Yeah. Okay. And that's kind of what runs. Well, through. yeah. And how how Stan, how stable is MI? Because I don't know the longer history. But MI is about the third machine interface. So it, it has to be pretty stable because otherwise Eclipse is fraud. So okay. It has to that we have to keep in mind that it's not. But it's designed for Eclipse. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's designed for, for anybody, but Eclipse is the 99% client. Okay. Yeah, not. To make two interfaces independent of the protocols, we are communicating all of them by some structured protocol like MI. We can introduce any other wire protocol in the future, as MI2, which is the right. part of protocol, already has various issues which cannot be fixed to great compatibility with Eclipse. But if we, if we write the communication and just to run some API which currently parses MI2, then we can later write another packet from the same API to keep the same test suite and replace the protocol MI2 by, for example, MI3 or some other protocol. Right. So it goes to make some structured uh, general API for communication with remote GDB and then MI2 is just one of the backends. Well, and that would be the nice thing is if we actually do a sort of cleaner redesign that we'd hopefully have that ability. Um, I mean, so my biggest fear is converting zillions and zillions of GDB test cases. I mean, the GCC ones, I'm not that worried about. That's going to be pretty straightforward. Bin utils is even simpler. That's probably, I'll probably start with bin utils because it's less painful. <laughs> uh, so I just oh. 
We can't stop. <laughs> we can continue later in the hallway too, I don't guess. Why why do you see ways to work? Yeah. Yeah, and I guess my main thing is if I start working on the core, I'm hoping other people will help with the test suites. <laughs> Join the Dejikanu mailing list because pretty soon I'll start discussing these ideas. Um, and my plan is I'm planning on discussing it for quite a while so that I don't have arguments once I start refactoring. 